Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. This is Liz Miller, SVP of Marketing with the CMO Council, joining you once again for a really great conversation, uh, really around attracting and engaging those fans. I think we all talk about everything from building our brand values and what that brand promises and how we're really reaching out and engaging and distilling those messages with our fans, but it is even more of a complex thing to really achieve, to do right, do well, and really build a brand that is truly attracting, engaging fans with their needs, with their behaviors, with their insights in mind. Um, we are really going to be talking to two folks who are not only seeing this across a very broad landscape, but are in the thick of making some of these important transitions really as we speak. So when we start talking about culturally connected brands that are valued, that are real, that are relevant with our customers, I think the word that immediately jumps out, at least for me, is this concept of relevance. And I think it's something that we all talk about today in this age of the customer experience and the fast-moving connected customer, that digital experience, we're always really talking about um, what is that relevance? What are we driving as far as relevance to our customers? But far too often, at least I find, that conversation tends to really center around campaigns. Are we driving relevant content into the relevant channel to the right segment of customer? Um, but for me, I think the important is taking that step back. How do I take that step back and really understand if my brand has relevance and cultural relevance and real meaning for a customer? And the data points that kind of jumped out to me as I was thinking about this webcast and I've had a chance to talk with our panelists is this. We did a study about a year ago where we asked marketers, um, what, you know, did they have a brand platform that had those shared values, those ethics that the entire organization not only understood but embraced and had collective buy-in? And about 62% of the marketers that we spoke to said, absolutely, we have this cultural platform. We have this culture across our organization that everyone has bought into. Um, when we then asked, um, of this, of this brand promise, of this brand that you've delivered, do you believe that at every point of engagement, at every physical location, at every touch point that you have to the customer, that their organization believes that all the people and locations fully embody and reflect this brand personality? Only about 7% did. In reality, um, a lot of times what we feel is so relevant about our brands sometimes misses in a key word really of resonance. Not only does it not resonate with our internal constituents, but it certainly isn't resonating or feeling authentic with our external constituents. And this is a huge issue as we're moving into a time period where it's even harder to really connect with that connected customer. So we've got two great speakers today, and I'm really excited for you guys to hear from them both because I've had a chance to talk to them before this webcast. And uh, when I say that there's a lot of smart stuff, a lot of smart stuff is going to come up in this hour. So here are the rules of the road. You guys should know this by now. We're asking questions. Um, we're going to hear from John McGar and Matt Harsh. They're going to bring up some great things. But I know that everyone on this line is probably going to have a question. And for those of you joining us live, we want you to go ahead and ask those. So please feel free to submit those questions through the question dialog box in your Bright Talk viewer. We're going to get to as many of those after the conclusion of the presentation, uh, and, if, and those that we can't get to, we will absolutely get to offline. But, John, I'm actually going to turn this presentation over to you to get us started. All right. Thanks very much, Ashley, um, and uh, everyone that's uh, dialed in. Thanks very much for joining. Uh, my name is John McGarn. I'm the president of Fresh Squeeze Ideas. Uh, my organization is an insight strategy and execution company. Uh, with clients all across North America. And, and over the 10 years that we've been in business, we've touched over 400 brands. And, you know, every now and then we take a step back and we pause and reflect upon, you know, what we've learned, what the state of marketing is. And, and I wanted to share some some of that with you today. And it's really driven by this idea of this rapidly changing market that we live in. And, oh, my goodness, the news has given us so much material to uh, to work with in just the last few days. But I, I thought, you know, what's interesting to me as a, you know, career marketer is, you know, the tactics of marketing have certainly changed with, with the dawn of digital. But really the theory of branding and building brand as a business system has really not changed since, you know, the 60s or 70s, even earlier than that. But at the same time, demographically, we have changed dramatically. 
people are getting married later, uh, having fewer children, uh, mixed marriages, you know, from blended families, um, many women who are having children yet are not married. I mean, it's really a different world than, say, the heyday of, you know, uh, mad men in the 50s and the 60s and the, and the 70s. And and so as a, as a consultant in this industry, uh, you know, we pause and we think, well, surely there's an impact on how marketers market when the marketplace has changed so much. So I wanted to start sharing a story to try and illustrate the impact of shifting values, which fall out of the shifting demographics, and really how that ends up affecting um, you know, consumer behavior and how consumers are attracted to certain brands based on new values. So let me start off with this. This is what everybody in the world admires about America. It's a meritocracy. If you work hard, you'll be rewarded. And of course, there's a wide array of people that have that have demonstrated, you know, the, this the self-made man kind of idea. Fortunately, it's not all all men anymore. Um, but the idea that if, if you work hard in America, you you will you will reap the rewards. Not to go to doom and gloom right away, but there's a, there's a, a purpose here. If we pause and reflect on what happened in the economy in 2007 and 2008. You know, really there was a collapse of the American dream in that the banks were being bailed out, yet average Americans who were only trying to reap the rewards of their hard work, you know, basically lost their homes. And this is a very powerful photograph, um, uh, World Press Photo of the Year of a sheriff, you know, going through to secure a house that's been repossessed by the bank. It, it, it's, it's a real emblem of the collapse of the American dream. What's interesting is when you look at that moment in time where, where you know, we call it the American dream is dissolving here and you have governments bailing out the banks, that that could be perceived as a, as a betrayal of the American dream, right? Because the average citizen was, was not being rewarded for their hard work. In fact, you know, their, their, their housing or their, their investments, their retirement uh, investments are basically evaporating. That actually gave birth to two brands that I think is very interesting. So Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party, you know, while they blame different parties for the, uh, for, for the collapse, um, they're, they're both born out of the same tension. And the tension is around what is America and what I'm experiencing in this economic crisis is certainly in violation of that. And they're brands in that they were movements that were consumed you know, in, in the minds of, uh, of, of Americans. So it's quite interesting. Of course, in the last few days, we've had another dramatic change, but it, it is another example of when people are living with this chronic economic uncertainty, you know, coming from, in this case, globalization, perceived as, you know, only helping a few people. The average citizen, of course, is still struggling to maintain their economic prospects, let alone actually improve their, their economic standing. In the UK, uh, just the other day, this very complex problem of, of how do we deal with this economic uncertainty was basically uh, given a very blunt instrument for people to express their view. It was oversimplified down to a choice. Are you going to stay or leave the European Union? And so what does, what does a, the average person do? You know, they, they, they can't help themselves <laughs> almost that, you know, it's much harder to actually analyze all of the downsides of leaving the European Union and it's really easy to simply choose leave rather than remain. So culture has created this tension that ends up being manifest in a choice that people made at the polls. Now, I'm not trying to make any election prediction by any means here, but the same thing is actually happening in, in America. And regardless of what your, your political stripes are, you have a very interesting choice of president, right, um, that, that is essentially uh, activating on very, very similar issues, this, this uh, lack of optimism and feelings of betrayal, which are really a decade in the making. But let's turn this back to business, which, you know, we're all here to talk about brands and, and how this affects business. The real point here is that while we can see shifts in behavior, we need to recognize for marketing purposes, these cultural shifts really create opportunities. 
And so I'll give you a really great example here. Prior to the 2007-2008 crisis, vampires were the most popular thing in pop, in, in pop culture. You know, there's all the movies, the Twilight series, the books, the TV series, the movies. Um, those particular actors you know, became quite famous celebrities. But almost overnight, after this economic collapse, zombies became the most popular meme in pop culture. Now, there's a real difference between vampires and zombies, namely the amount of personal agency that each of them has. Vampires can transcend time, space, sexuality. They're very powerful with full personal control over themselves, whereas zombies are not at all, uh, you know, masters of their own domain. They're controlled by some invisible force that, you know, makes them want only brains and, uh, and they have no ability to live a, a full, rich life, which is kind of analogous, you know, to maybe the way some people were feeling as they lose control of, uh, of their economic, um, you know, well-being. The point is this, is that, is that people are drawn to what reflects their values. So people were drawn to choose to leave the European Union in, in, uh, in the UK. People are drawn to either Hillary or Donald Trump, you know, or Bernie Sanders up until recently, um, based on what their values are. And so we can identify some brands that have done very well and some that have, some that have lost very well um, as a result. So here's a, a, a great example. Lululemon did not invent yoga, but they really were at the right place at the right time. They built an ecosystem of products and services and stores at a time when the cultural values were around fitness and health were really the, the dominant value. And our society was secular, and we're looking for a place to enact their spirituality. In comes Lululemon, and it becomes a wildly successful business. They're in the right point at the right time with a proposition that suddenly was relevant. And what's important is it was relevant for cultural reasons. I'll give you another example. The Scion automobile. Um, basically was created as a distinct brand because at that point in time, um, Toyota could not sell vehicles to younger buyers. You know, the parents' Camry wasn't nearly cool enough for them. So they created this different brand and basically managed it quite separately. Well, lo and behold, the economic crisis happens, and suddenly, you know, those young people are looking at their parents' you know, economical, sensible choice, saying, well, you know what, they're not as stupid as I, uh, as, as I thought. Uh, suddenly, Scion doesn't have a reason for being anymore because Toyota is suddenly um, quite acceptable. Now, I'm sure there's a million other reasons that may influence this, but the cultural context is a very powerful uh, factor in, uh, in, in, in the context in which people choose to, uh, to select a product. The point is that social values evolve and markets change, and for marketers, you know, Really, the opportunity is to invest some time and effort to understand, well, how does this macro context of culture affect your business? So we've, we've recently completed uh, a study uh, called the Real Modern Family Study, and, and it is the center third of a book that we've just released, which, uh, which you can click on um, within your, your viewer. There's a link to, uh, to order the book called Reincarnation, The Death and Rebirth of Marketing. In the Real Modern Family uh, study, you know, we've been able to look at uh, all of the – or several brands that have really risen as a result of the cultural forces that are acting on families. Now, we chose, we chose families rather than millennials because everyone's heard too much about millennials and baby boomers. Of course, we all know about baby boomers. But families are an interesting social unit. And so in a response to economic uncertainty, we can see a popularity or a rising popularity of car sharing, you know, gift card exchange programs, entertainment being consumed that's all based around survival skills. Those are all uh, aiding people in their need to be able to survive in a, in a period of economic uncertainty. Also, we can see how, how parents prepare their kids for living in a time of economic uncertainty. So we, we help them choose or, or learn how to make choices. 
So Netflix, even a child can have their own profile. Coca-Cola Freestyle Dispenser allows them to choose any beverage that they want. They really get the practice. Or it's never too young to start training kids, so Baby Einstein is a line of toys that helps their, their mental development. Triathlon for kids allows them to, uh, to, to become physically fit, able to survive and prosper. All of these things have economic value because of the cultural context in which we live. So the brands themselves are really the artifacts of the real lives. And the opportunity for brands is how do you engineer your role such that your brand has greater economic value? What you need are some market sensing tools. And so here's just two that we use. The one on the left is Cultural Forces Lab. You can access that you know, at your leisure at culturalforceslab.com. And it's really just a free learning tool that we've put out to help marketers understand the link between cultural forces and different brands. If you simply click on one side, the left or the right uh, of, of this page, you can either dive into a cultural force or you can click on a brand and see how they've leveraged cultural forces in some of their communications. Lots of funky brands on there, Gatorade, Under Armour, um, Honda's on there. Las Vegas is in there as well. Very, very funny uh, advertising communications driven by culture. So you can certainly understand, you can strive to understand culture, you know, which we happen to be experts in with anthropologists on staff. But what we've learned is really needed, though, is is a way to integrate culture into your business system and into your brand strategy. So using a model that, that very specifically integrates culture is a way of making it actionable so that you can actually drive your marketing mix with, with this kind of, uh, of, of insight. I'm going to get ready to turn it over to, uh, to Matt Harsh who's going to talk about, uh, about Bob Evans Farms, but I, I want to illustrate, maybe set him up a little bit with, with a particular cultural force that is relevant for, for his brand. And that's all around authenticity. And I think everybody will recognize that authenticity has been a trend for the past several years. And, and here's three quick versions of authenticity um, that have real value. We all know about the craft movement. You know, probably craft beer is the best example, but it's really an antidote to mass-produced products. Uh, so they're much more individual and have uh, old-time quality. Um, of course, there's real as opposed to artificial um, as, as being a driver of authenticity, certainly in the food business, um, getting away from, uh, from uh, you know, artificial ingredients is a trend that's been very popular. And, and, of, and of course, there's another one around uh, local. And, and local is that the product comes from somewhere rather than a nameless, faceless factory somewhere. You know, so Jack Daniels is a great example of it's from Lynchburg, Tennessee, and that gets root in authenticity. But I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Matt to talk about Bob Evans that I, that I think is a brand that activates on on many of these uh, many of these cues. Matt, over to you. Hey everyone, how are you? Um, just to give you a little background, my name is Matt Harsh, and you know Liz touched on it a little bit. Vice President of Marketing for Bob Evans Restaurant. Um, I'll give you a little background on Bob Evans as well if you're not aware of what the brand is. Um, I was also been here with about four years. Um, prior to that, I was actually at Bath & Body Works on the retail side. So um, slightly different industry, but obviously the same goal is to um, create a perception and drive people into buying more of your product. So what I wanted to touch on, um, kind of build off what John was talking about, is kind of five key things when it comes to Bob Evans. One is, what is Bob Evans? And um, some of you may be aware and some not. Um, the consumer versus the industry versus Bob Evans. And it's just really this somewhat to authenticity, but really what is old is what is new again. Um, especially in the restaurant industry, it's really evolved over the last 50, 60 years. Um, stomach competition, um, more competition from a food standpoint than ever before from grocery stores, restaurants, home, sea stores, everywhere you can think you can um, get a meal at a similar quality, even though authenticity continues to build. Um, and the one difference in restaurants versus retail is there's a max out. You're not adding a fourth meal of the day. You're not adding a fifth meal of the day. Different in retail, I can stock your cabinets with as many lotions as you possibly want from Bath & Body Works and know the usage isn't going to match up. So it's definitely a shared game. 
Um, and the other last part is just where the trend is when it comes to farm um, and what are we at Bob Evans doing. So the, the first slide we go to next um, is really what is Bob Evans? And the, the wonderful thing about Bob Evans that is somewhat a marketer's dream is it's a true story. It's not a story made up. Um, so for those of you who are not aware, Bob was a true man um, who started a restaurant um, and a food product basically back in the 50s. Um, it built off sausage. So just like authenticity and quality, he saw an open um, need for fresh sausage. And he basically, from his farm, it was really basically him driving sausage across the border to West Virginia, to Ohio, all the different places. And the brand basically built off him and his wife, Jewel. Um, and you can see the pictures there. That is actually the farm down in Rio Grande, Ohio, which we still own. Restaurant right on the farm. One of our 550 restaurants that we have was the first restaurant. And the restaurant was really a way for him to sell his food products. It started out that way. Um, and it's actually grown to a bigger business that with the 550 restaurants we have, we also have food products across the nation from our sausage and side business. Um, but the part that really resonated the most with the business was the emotional attachment, not only to the products, but you can see a board in there that it wasn't a marketing plan. It wasn't a strategy. It was the essence and the DNA of the brand. Um, we treat strangers like friends and friends like family. And Bob, just as, you know, he carried through the DNA of his culture, it was everyone was welcomed at the, his porch. And his restaurant, just like his wife, Jewel, was about coming to their house and welcoming. So what it kind of leads to a little bit on the next page is kind of the industry a little bit. And it's a little bit of an eye chart, so I apologize. But kind of where John was going a little bit on what did the industry and the culture drive. And you can see Bob Evans started basically in the 60s. On the bottom of the chart, you can see all the restaurants, kind of our core chains that are around today, um, really started in the late 60s and early 70s from Wendy's, Cracker Barrel. Uh, McDonald's had already started that time, but Applebee's, Chili's. Um, and one of the lines on there, you can't see it's probably, uh, real well in this minute, is one of the key drivers for restaurants' growth is women out of the household. Um, and you can see as restaurants continue to grow, women went from 40% out of the household up to 60%. And obviously that trend continues to grow um, to John's point when people are getting married less and others. So there was this need not only from a speed standpoint, um, but also to deliver great product. Um, so this was really the key trend. And the interesting thing, as you go to the next slide, um, is Bob's consumer versus industry. And this will get into the authenticity of kind of what's old and new. And Bob Evans was one of the first restaurants that truly was farm to table. Um, back in the 50s and 60s, it truly was taking that authenticity product. And as time went, and especially, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, just as anything else, just as the car industry or anything else, it became about efficiency. And it became a lot about, you know, how do you get a more reliable product out to the consumer at a higher rate. Um, so this whole 80s, 90s time period with all these fast food restaurants, and you can see the bottom chart down there, it, it has many different touch points than maybe even the consumer perceives it has even today. And there's a lot of competitors who are trying to change that perception, even though they're still utilizing that same mentality. And I think the consumer today expects that top chart up there of basically farm to table to be everywhere it goes. Um, and that's one of the industry changes and challenges of the restaurant, especially Bob Evans, to leverage that mentality. So the other challenge we have for restaurants is competition. Um, and this chart is, we're based in Columbus, and this was something the university did. And it just shows all the different competitors from fast, casual, some chains you may be aware of, some you may not, um, fast food. Um, the big one, the big growth there, which is, also a cultural shift with all the food shows, with the everyone thinks they're a chef. Um, home continues to grow. Um, grocery stores with whole foods of already prepared food continues to dominate and get a similar quality faster in a different way. Bob Evans has, has leveraged that in one way from our food products because our side business um, has over a 50% market share 
Um, our signature mashed potatoes are the best in the industry. So we're leveraging that from the food product standpoint, but the restaurant business is one that continues to be um, definitely dominated and attacked, not only from traditional chains, but you can even see in there a lot of local, um, more where kind of John was going with craft concepts that gets back to that authenticity that people are resistant to more mass change from a trust standpoint. So the good part about Bob Evans in the industry is the farm is cool. Everywhere you go from home design, from kitchens, um, I'm seeing more and more houses in neighborhoods with barn roofs. I'm seeing more and more open kitchens. You know, you think about the home design shows. Um, you see the bottom right corner there, obviously a very popular show that has a very farm essence all the way through. Um, so the idea of farm, not only in our everyday lives, but even to our home life, has become very cool and very welcoming to go back to our heritage. And even from a competitive standpoint, on the next page, farm from the food industry, everyone's trying to leverage it. You know, farm to table from farmer's markets, um, grocery stores, that top right is a local, um, I think it actually is based in Denver, but we have one here in Columbus, um, is a, you know, trying to take a farmer's market mentality called Lucky's and really leverage the local feel. Um, from store design, more and more people are going after community, large tables, hardwoods, mason jars. Um, the whole chef-inspired has gone to is more from a farm standpoint. Um, and I don't have pictures in here, but traditional chains are also trying to leverage that farm feel. Um, you know, McDonald's, I saw a truck the other day that trying to talk about their lettuce came from the farm and built to the Big Mac. Um, Wendy's, you know, from a fast food standpoint, is talking about the quality and they have commercials where and they're in a strawberry field. Um, everyone from grocery stores is also leveraging that quality story into where John was talking about, trying to get back to that authenticity and build that trust with the consumer. So what is Bob Evans doing about it? Last couple slides here. Um, the great thing is, you know, it's the hardest thing to do, as we all know from a marketing standpoint, and it's also the best thing to do is to keep it simple and go to the DNA and essence of your brand. Um, and focus on those attributes that made you great, but how do you carry it through all the way through? So number one, Bob Evans was built off of everyday value. Um, we have to get back to that and focus on that value connection. Quality with connection to our real farm. You know, everyone's out there talking about, you know, they have a farm, they don't have a farm, the connection. We have a true history story with a farm, um, a local feel with Ohio, um, with Midwest. We need to continue to connect that. But the most important one is back to small town hospitality, which is the hardest thing to do from a cultural standpoint, but it builds that emotional attachment. It also goes where the, the, the world is going from a slower pace, slow down, back to a lot of the things of zombies and vampires and um, the election and all those different things. People want to pause. Um, and Bob Evans is a space that can give you that and also a smile and a welcoming face and connects to that home. So the same thing that Bob had from we treat strangers like friends and friends like family, we need to leverage that and have that carry through all the aspects of our brand. So the last page I have on here, um, which is not on here, um, so the one page, and I'll pass it on to John, is just getting back to the roots of the brand. Um, from a store design standpoint, from a connection to um, the everyday value, and most importantly, getting to back to the warmth and the emotional attachment that everyone is somebody when they come to Bob Evans um, and connecting from a local feel. So I think, John, I'll pass it on to you. That, that's awesome. I, um, I, I really enjoyed the, the, the comment that you made around you know, we can see in many different areas of, of modern life where people are choosing to slow down and and how small town hospitality and, and, and the propositions from Bob Evans fits into that. The, you know, the, the, one of the challenges in this area now is how can brands um, not only understand but even anticipate shifts in culture to uh, to take advantage of this, you know, to make sure that you're in the right place at the right time. So, you know, 
if if I look at this proposition, you know, we treat strangers like friends and friends like family. You know, there's a lot of – and the farm is cool. I love that idea. There's a lot of examples of, you know, if I think back over the last 10 years where I say, okay, I can see how all of the stars align that make this proposition really powerful. But, but I don't know if anyone's familiar, but there's a thing called the slow food movement. You know, it, was, it started in Italy, um, and it's all about really getting back to – um, food that is local to an area, you know, tomatoes that come from a certain place or potatoes that are, the, you know, the best potatoes come from this place. And instead of creating these global, you know, um, commodities that are grown in places where they, you know, have never belonged before, that that links, you know, to me that feels like it's in the same uh, the same path. I remember when when the uh, when the the game, you know, the the little. Um, uh, digital game uh, Farmville was super popular a number of years ago. I thought, you know, here it is. Farm has not been cool for so many years, and all of a sudden, this this game has put the word farm on almost everybody's lips again. That's really powerful. And then here we are. You, know, you fast forward a couple a couple years later, and yes, you're right. You see, you know, the farm and imagery and all of that back to you know back to an older, simpler time um, as being more trustworthy. And and so as a brand, I think, you know, there, there's an opportunity to recognize why are people doing that? You know, why, why do they value these things suddenly at this particular point in time? The downside to a modern life is, you know, th- that our, our society can often feel very temporary or or transient or disposable, kind of plastic and like nothing really has lasting value. And it's the tension from that that makes people want to try and slow down and appreciate, smell the flowers, you know, uh, and go to a farm-based concept to feel like they're connected to a better time, a more, a more simple time. Um, it, it, it is very interesting to uh, to see how, um, how then Bob Evans is focusing in on the essence. And, of course, the challenge then is how do you determine exactly how to activate against this idea of, you know, we treat strangers like friends and friends like family through all consumer touch points. But I love the idea of focusing on what makes you great. You know, the the really the message for for the marketers, I mean, we're using some examples here to illustrate uh, a point, and then the point is about understanding the cultural relevance or the cultural connection to what drives your brand. And if you can understand that, you can have a tremendous impact in the marketplace. So I'll just give three quick examples, and then uh, and then my content is pretty much done here. But um, we worked on on a project with Nissan to launch this uh, subcompact car uh, in the marketplace, and from our work, they were able to appreciate a quality about their target market that is really quite interesting. These, these people were quite quirky in the way that they uh, made decisions of what they were going to spend their time and money on, and and so. The agency was smart enough to hire in uh, Jim Parsons, who, uh, you know, embodies Quirky, you know, uh, in his character from um, from the Big Bang Theory. Um, but this advertising with this with this uh, imagery and, and, and whatnot with Jim Parsons, you know, really propelled this product to be number one in its class. You know, who wouldn't want to be number one? You know, another example is, uh, you know, one of our healthcare clients, uh, EpiPen, for those that have um, anaphylaxis, it, it can be a life-saving device. But there's a lot of people who are really afraid of, of this and, and, and afraid of having, living with a fatal, you know, what could be a fatal uh, health condition that they deny, you know, even, you know, in denial that they have this or that they need to uh, protect themselves. By understanding kind of those cultural tensions, we're able to help them develop a strategy that drove their business by 100%, doubled their business from basically a standstill. And and even driving innovation, um, product innovation, there's a small regional dairy um, that, that wanted to, uh, to have this innovation pipeline, and we started layering in cultural, um, you know, cultural learning. They were able, in, a, in an industry that has an 80% failure rate on new products, They've launched three products in a row and have had 
three consecutive wins exceeding their expectations. Now, very often when, I, when I'm doing a talk on this and I, and I ask marketers, you know, how many of you have launched a product and it's met your expectations, there's not a lot of people that actually put their, put their hands up, let alone is it exceeding your expectations. You know, the, the, the point is through, through using the power of culture, there's a real opportunity to drive breakout performance. So for, for those that wish to, uh, to dive in a little deeper and learn how to engineer breakout performance like that, we, we, we've captured all of our philosophies and the approaches in this book, Reincarnation, the Death and Rebirth of Marketing. We explain, you know, the roots of attraction and the key concept being attraction rather than jamming messages of people attracting them to you. Uh, we identify what the missing critical pieces are and, you know, it won't be a surprise if I say culture is it. <laughs> um, it's really undervalued. Um, we try to demonstrate how to create real meaningful value by using that for organizations and then we give some really good specific examples when, you know, in, in this real modern family study <clears throat> that we conducted across North America with, with uh, some great ethnographic research. Um, it's, uh, it, for a limited time, the book's available free of charge, limited to, but you can, you get one for yourself and gift one to, uh, to a friend that might appreciate it as well. I think it's probably that's, a great time for some questions, Ashley. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is uh, that is great, and thank you so much uh, for that. And, folks, if you are looking to uh, get in on John's awesome offer for this book, we've gone ahead and put a link right in the attachments uh, section of your viewer. So uh, certainly take an opportunity because uh, I know that a lot of the things that are shared here, I've had a chance to have a little bit of a sneak peek and a preview of this. So thank you, John, for uh, for sending that over to me. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something uh, you know worth worth filling out that form for and also sending some friends. So listen, we're going to go on to some questions here. And uh, I always tell people, certainly, um, you know, with, with my job here at the CMO Council, I get to uh, be really the front line audience for uh, folks like yourselves, uh, John and Matt. But my payment. My, uh, what I get paid in, my currency, is I get to ask the first question. So while our audience is uh, submitting those questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss a couple out at you guys. So uh, let, me, let me start here first. You know, John, you, you talk a lot about, you know, certainly that cultural relevance, being able to capture that, being able to see some of those trends. And I think some of the, you know, certainly as we look at where marketing is today, so much of what we're talking about and so much what we hear about day in and day out is really about kind of listening to that voice of the customer. We dive into our customer data systems. We kind of go in to see what those behaviors are, those transactional data, and we try to get into all of that. Um, as we're trying to balance what our customers, that transactional trend that we're looking at, um, how do we then, are there also cues that we can be picking up from our own customer data and from what our customers are telling us directly that we should also be adding into this amalgam of culture? Yeah, w without a doubt. I mean, what people do and why they do it, I, I think it's not a surprise or it wouldn't be controversial for me to say these are completely different things. The, yeah. You know, I, I used to work um, for a hair care company, and, and one of the things that I would do is if I saw someone shopping either at a hair salon, going to buy one of our um, one of our shampoos or styling products, or in a supermarket, you know, going to buy another brand, I would approach them and, and just have a conversation. I wouldn't reveal where I worked or what I was doing. I, I would just be curious. Now, I'm sure some women might find it kind of weird that this middle-aged man is talking to you about hair in the middle of the grocery store. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can be a personal guy on occasion, so I, so they, they went with it. But, it, but, it. but it's amazing how much you can learn when you're not asking direct questions about what are you doing, why are you doing it, but just engage in the conversation. And if you listen carefully, you can hear what the values are that is leading people to make the choices that they do. Um, you know, e even if you watch the, the way people purchase something like coffee versus tea, it's very, very different. You know, one's a routine. They just knock it into the cart. Uh, but another one, uh, you know, is, is all about a different experience, and they shop, and they look, and they try and figure out, well, what am I looking for today? And and getting into the whys behind that uh, is, is where the rich stuff really is. So the transactional data is great for helping us understand where is the behavior occurring, like like what's actually happening. 
And the key then is to dive in and understand, well, exactly why is that happening and and what is driving it beyond just them answering your question. Because yeah. usually when, pe- when people are out actually making a purchase, they're converting on an idea that is planted, you know, well beforehand. Somehow something got on their shopping list or they're in their consideration set for a reason. And, and marketers need to know those reasons so that you can – amplify, you know, their desire, um, and obviously you want them to choose your brand over someone else's, but you, you, you want to attract them, right, by being yeah. able to send the signal that, that you understand. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I think that sometimes we need to also get out of our own way um, and stop thinking that what got that product or what got that need on the list was an email that we sent or a commercial that we, tri- <laughs> you know, a commercial that we placed, that the, the, the cultural impact of the why is, is often uh, right there just under the surface, and, and it's our role to kind of pick that out and, and uh, amplify it across the organization. And, you know, and so, Matt, that really leads me to a question for you, because when we think about, um, you know, I, I kind of hear time and time again when I'm talking to marketers that we kind of understand that these shifts need to happen. We understand that this change and being able to keep up with not only these cultural drivers that are impacting our market, but really being able to understand where and how the customer is shifting um, can often make marketers feel like they're in a very lonely position, like we're the ones trying to kind of shift the barge that's moving super slowly. But Bob Evans has a different scenario. You guys have really founded out of a culture of not just focusing on, um, you know, the customer, but also focusing on those ingredients, focusing on value, uh, and really being able to kind of keep that as a common value across the organization. How important is it for you in the marketing role that from CEO all the way down to the store level that you do have that alignment around that kind of about the central um, kind of essence of your brand. Can you share a little bit about uh, kind of how that dynamic plays out and and really how then your partnership really with the CEO, um, you know, is helpful in driving kind of any type of change across the organization? Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that I underestimated coming from Bath and Body Works to Bob Evans was the power of culture um, and the power of, you know, even though you have 40,000, 50,000 employees, you're one singular voice. Um, and we all know it. It goes from the top down, right? If you aren't if you aren't consistent and, you know, I, I kind of compare it to the telephone game, right? If you have 10 strategies, by the time it gets to Susie in California, there's 150 strategies because everyone tweaks it a little <laughs> bit. So as hard as it is to stay simple, and even though you may be over it before it even got to the customer because you've been working on it for six months, um, that alignment is super important just to make sure that everyone is speaking the same language. The great thing about Bob Evans is it's um, we have a very older culture who's been with the brand a long time, so there's a high engagement with the brand and an excitement to go back to the DNA of what attracted them to the brand in the first place. Um, yeah. And we have a, a customer base who's extremely passionate um, and remembers what the brand stood for in the past and wants to get back to there. So uh, it, the great thing is we're all on the same page of what the brand needs to be. The hard thing, like any business, is getting there in a simple way so it's consistent through all communication levels. Yeah, yeah, sure, excellent. You know, one question has come in that I just want to, it's a more of a housekeeping question, so I want to take care of it quickly and then want to dive into a couple other questions that have been submitted here. Um, in regard to is this available on demand, yes, this webcast is going to be available on demand, so trust me, all of the great things that John and Matt have both shared here, it's going to be available. Uh, you're going to be able to use the same link and be able to access this, uh, really, even just about five minutes after the uh, webcast is, is concluded here. But before we end, we've got a couple more questions to take care of. John, this question's come in, and uh, I'm, I am 100% positive it's for you. Um, I am really also 100% crossing my fingers that you understand what this question is because you are far smarter than I, sir. Um, so you will be able to give us a brilliant answer for it. But the question that has come in says, is the trend regression to safety? Is the trend regression to safety? It, it all comes back to safety. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, to, to some degree, um, I would say that's 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 not a bad um, conclusion. You know, when we're living with chronic uncertainty, 
you know, and, and in this case, it's economic uncertainty as, a, as opposed to, you know, uh, say wartime where you're not sure if you're going to survive or not. Yes, those, those fundamental uh, needs need to be met and, and safety um, could be one. And so we did see in our, in our Real Modern Family study, you know, trying to teach children how to survive um, becomes very important. And, and while, of course, we're not really talking about the apocalypse or anything like that, but just the principles of, look, watch, you know, not, not literally watch Survivor because we'll teach you how to survive, but it's amazing how people will gravitate to a movie like The Impossible, which is about the, uh, the Indian Ocean tsunami, and watch how this family struggled to survive as a way of teaching kids perseverance and and to to continue to have that will to thrive and, and move forward. You know, so safety from the point of view of I'm going to teach you skills that will allow you to take care of yourself. And, and that's the cultural need that comes out of this economic uncertainty, right? Or, um, or, or even the, there's even kind of a frontier logic um, right now that has kind of taken hold, which is, you know, amongst families, you know, there's really not a lot of social networks that's going to take care of us. Even the way we live, we're not as connected to our neighbors as we used to be in the old days. So we're really just down to ourselves. Like it, it's our family unit, and kind of a circle the wagons kind of mentality. Um, and then it, it goes back to then, well, how we then survive or prosper or, um, you know, starts to drive fundamental demand for, um, for certain products and activities. Um, I, I think it's all about safety, yes. Um, you know, safety in keeping our family um, prosperous, healthy, moving forward, you know, productive, competitive, all those wonderful things. Yeah. Um, I will I will share with you the uh, funny comment that came in that uh, I think might sum it up for other people there that you might have to actually explain what uh, the trend regression <clears throat> to safety actually means because the exact quote is, uh, please explain what that means for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so we, you know, when, we, when we talk about all these different cultural forces, it sounds like, you know, if, if we were able to model them all out, um, would they, w w could you boil it down to a simple concept of safety, w which is kind of like, rather than studying culture, let's just look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and would that, w would that get us to where we want to go? Is that where Great. And, 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 and so really, the, you know, the answer to that is actually no from a, for marketing purposes. So what, what's, in, what's, what's great about culture is that it is rich. And the richer it is, the more nuanced brand strategies can be made. And, right. and while re relevance is certainly important, differentiation is also important. In fact, probably even more important. And by using, instead of boiling down to a lowest common denominator, actually staying with these rich, ideas within culture actually gives lots of brands lots of room to build strategies that are different from one another and highly relevant. Yeah. And, you know, this this question has really come in for Matt, but, John, I'd, I'd like to kind of start with you on one quick thing, and then, Matt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose the, the question. Um, John, can you define what it would mean to have purpose um, or kind of what purpose would play in, in a role for a brand? Well, purpose for, you know, so we use purpose in our model and, and really all it is is a focal point, right? It, it is, if you take, if you take your culture that you're trying to activate on, your brand equities, how you're different in the market and, and how you, how, how you understand your consumer and you bring that together, you can use purpose as the thing that simplifies what is basically those are four inputs and can be complex. You can simplify it into a single idea. And so Matt, you know, the, the version that, uh, that Matt talked about, we treat strangers like friends and friends like family. It's a sentence. It's very clear. Um, and it provides focus so that it is the lens through which anyone in the organization should be able to judge whether what they're doing is in line with, you know, our promise to the consumer you know, that ultimately has that full marketing mix in it. Hey, you know, another great example, Whole Foods, right? Their, their purpose is about being America's healthiest grocery store. 
And if you go through any Whole Foods stores, you'll see it's not just the fact that they have organic food. It's actually the way they bring that food to market is also a very healthy uh, ecosystem. Mm. So, mm-hmm. so purpose really is the, the, the it, it, it encompasses all of the input into a clear strategy and then gives guidance for the organization. Nice. So, so then, Matt, this, this leads me into a, a question for you. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to purpose, what role does purpose play in your approach and in your, um, you know, customer engagement approach? But then also, how is purpose then kind of established across the organization? Because you also, while you have a very kind of clear, um, value proposition and very clear purpose, I think, and certainly John has punctuated that, you have a very, um, you know, complex market and that you have, what, did you say, 500 stores? I mean, I think it was, you know, you have a ton of stores, you have a ton of different locations, your brand means lots of different things to lots of different people, both internally and externally. So can you share with us what what role purpose plays um, in your approach with engaging not only with your external, but also your internal constituents? Yeah, I think the, and there's another question on here about farming, and I think the the purpose gets back to the emotional attachment of the brand and the emotional right. attachment of the farm. It's not about the land, right? You know, I jokingly say, you know, when you were a kid, and it's kind of like the church, right? The church is a building, but it's the people inside. And it's about same with the farm. It's about the people. It's about the connection to quality. It's connection to the animals. It's connection to nature. It's the warmth and connection to family. So the purpose is really about connecting to people. It's surrounded by food, but at the essence is really the purpose of connecting to people that you care about and expressing with food and the environment what they mean to you. Yeah, yeah. And I think the question that, that we were talking about here, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, so if there is anything you want to add to that, uh, the question that's come in, uh, there's a comment to the question. It says, local farming today is very sophisticated, and much of it's going high tech, which is absolutely true. I think the ag tech space is Absolutely fascinating. Um, are we? The question is: Are we reaching back to history rather than actual local farming now? Are you seeing that difference play out, or is it really kind of both things are happening, um, and and really you're seeing them happen really at at each table? Yeah, I mean, I think the the question is right. Farming is one of the more sophisticated things, just like technology and everything else. But we're not a farmer. You know, right. that's where I think right. you get back to your purpose piece. Just as Whole Foods um, is connecting farmers markets, a lot of families are going to farms. Now there's a farm um, north of us that, you know, has become a very hot spot for families with apple picking and mazes and um, tours for schools and all those things. It's, it's the essence and the purpose of the farm, back to the purpose question, not necessarily going to the technology aspect of what a farm does. Now, yeah. other brands certain competitors, have gone to more of the historical, so they're transporting you to a time. We're not, that's not our desire. Our desire is more of the essence of what it means to connect to people and the essence of what Bob stood for, which goes through time. It doesn't have to do with, you know, are the tractors bigger or faster now. It's more of what does that small community connection really matter to people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's a great point. And, you know, John, I'm going to ask this question of you first, and Matt, if you have anything uh, that you want to add in here. The question kind of came in very specifically, so to be fair to the person who's asked this question, I do want to say that. Uh, the question kind of came in very specifically around the example of, um, you know, kind of the increasing question around, uh, you know, the intention of farmers and their use of chemicals and organics and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the kind of how do you avoid that guilt by association as those questions begin to come up. But, John, what I what I I'd like to do is kind of rephrase that hey, question and maybe use it hey, Liz. as a diff- Yes. I apologize, but I actually have to step off because they have a fire going on in oh. our building, I guess. So I no, apologize no. for having to step up, but there's an alarm going off, so I don't want to get Go be safe. No, no, no. Okay, Go I will be talk safe. to you later. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. Very, very uh, authentic. Officially the most the, dramatic. The, 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 yeah. Yeah, the, the officially the most dramatic thing that's ever happened on a CMO Council webcast, right there, folks, and you've been able to witness it. But uh, we'll we'll sort of soldier on for the last couple of minutes here, and maybe um, you know maybe you'll be able to uh, tackle this question uh, you know on, on everyone's behalf. But um, you know when it comes to the issue around kind of some of those cultural conversations that emerge, right? Whether it is about questioning the safety of food, GMOs, 
uh, you know, pesticides, all of those types of things, to, you know, safety of cars, safety of the environment, kind of all of those questions that come out. Um, how do we as brands kind of focus on what that cultural shift would be versus maybe focusing in on the noise? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's, a, it's a really good question. Basically, you need to pick the thing that you're going to champion. And, mm. and so I, I can give you, I give you a couple examples. I'll go back to Whole Foods again, right? Um, you know, Whole Foods thinks it's healthier. So the, their purpose is to be America's healthiest grocery store. They think it's healthier to allow the American consumer to choose when they're going to go for the, the organic blueberries or the super-duper good-for-all-the-birds-and-the-bees organic uh, blueberries, right? And, and if, if, you've, you know, if you crack the windshield in your car and you're a little short for cash that week, you might choose the regular ones. But if you're flush and you're, you really want to splurge, you might go for the super-expensive ones. Their interpretation of, of, of healthy is to provide that kind of choice. Take another organization like, like Chipotle, and, 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 of course, they have – you know, crafted a wonderful, you know, cultural branded message around um, um, cultivate a better world, you know, through their own view of the world, which is around non-GMO fast food. Now, look, it's fast food, right? Their burritos are as big as your head, probably more <laughs> calories than a person needs. But they're not about trying to solve all of the issues are about trying to solve the one that they think their customers care about most. And so it, it, it is having a bit of bravery to say, we're going after this one. We're not trying to go after all of them because no brand can solve absolutely everything. Um, you, you go after the one that fits with your brand and is meaningful to your consumers. So it, it's about choices like, like anything in marketing. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a, that's a great point, um, and I think oftentimes can be really hard to stick with, right? Because I think that uh, those of us in marketing, we have been known to potentially chase the bright and shiny toy. We've been we've been known to chase the crowd, um, so I think that's a I think that's a great point. Um, speaking of well, bright if, and shiny, if, if I, if, yeah, if, if I yeah. can actually let, let me just let me just pick up on that because that, that's an interesting yeah. point that I, I was going to raise earlier. So Matt was in a great position where with Bob Evans. You know, here's this brand that's been around a very long time. They've distilled down to the essence of what makes it great. We have many experiences where we see marketers on brands that have been around even longer than Bob Evans. Mm -hmm. And what the brand ends up focusing on over time kind of shifts. You know, it, it migrates all over the place. And you end up in a, in a point where you look at it and you say, okay, you're not winning in the marketplace, and look how far you've come off of what made you great in the first place. We worked on, a, on one particular brand that is almost a century old, and we did a complete historical review to help them identify, you know, the thing that made you great in the 1930s actually is still relevant today. You just need to tell mm -hmm. it in a modern way. Right. Yeah. And clearly, and clearly, Bob Evans has in, in the answer that Matt gave you around: is it about farming and, and all the issues with that? It's it's all about what is the essence that you need to focus on, right? And and clearly, they've done it. It's not about we're being farmers. It's that we have uh, you know an ethos that is rooted in the values of farming, right? That's that's the critical part is to then allow the brand to continue in a straight line rather than drifting from one lane to the other over time. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And I think it actually ties into this question that's come in from the audience that I want to that, that I want to have you tackle. Mm -hmm. um, so the the questions come in, some industries have a very deep-seated lack of trust and skepticism with the consumer. Um, I, I certainly think that, you know, lack of trust, gosh knows, that's a huge topic. And actually, in some of the examples you gave at the very beginning um, of, of your presentation. Um, so the question is, how can consumer values help determine potential partnerships for communication and education to the consumer? Is that something we need to look at as maybe not necessarily within our own brand or in our industry of, or who we partner with to kind of bolster some of those, um, you know, feelings of trust or at least kind of breaking through some of those trust issues? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, it, it, it's a little loaded. So let me try and come at it yeah. from two angles. One is, um, and, and I'm being a little cynical here, uh, hey, why not just be trustworthy? <laughs> Why not be trustworthy in the first place? Right? Uh, you know, the, 
you don't need a partner. Uh, and and here's, here's an example. So Sony launched this Xperia Z5 phone. All the marketing had pictures of people taking pictures with the phone of people in the swimming pool, right? Like, and, and the camera is, or the, the phone is, is basically claimed as waterproof. Well, when people actually start submerging the phone underwater, taking pictures of the friends, guess what? The phone doesn't work anymore. And <laughs> Sony had to, had, they, you know, they had to, you know, release this message saying, well, it wasn't tested and those kind of conditions. And, you know, it's like, come on, people. Like, you know, marketing and R&D, obviously, we're not, you know, clear with each other around, well, what can and can it not do? And what's the boundary between what we say and don't say, right? So that's just a betrayal of trust. Now, you know, so my point is, well, just be trustworthy. You know, don't lie. Yeah. It's the yeah. easy thing. But, <laughs> but assuming that's not where the question is coming from, assuming that it's, well, okay, how do you, how do you leverage uh, the trust or, or, or engender trust in a relationship through the selection of partners? That, quite honestly, that is where having a model becomes very useful. Right, because you can start looking at, okay, well, here's your property, you know, your brand and what it represents and what its cultural forces are that are enacting on it. Let's now look at a bunch of other brands that might be potential partners and let's look, well, where objectively is actually the alignment? Is it in a cultural tension or force that both brands come together? Is it that the, the consumer has, you know, some, some values that, that are aligned? You know, how can you actually take two models you know that you know and and identify where the overlap is to me that's how right. i would pick a partner right it, right it, that definitely is not about here let's stick the celebrity in because they're trustworthy and that will right. have a halo on our brand the consumer is far too sophisticated to fall for that stuff anymore in 2016 yeah, and I think that actually goes to kind of one of the one of the final questions that's come in, which is really around kind of the different values, uh, or really even around the same product that may happen internationally, um, kind of with varying cultural trends that may happen when you're looking at um, an international lens versus maybe saying just a domestic lens. Um, you know, the questions come in is, you know, um, is it even possible to brand meaningfully internationally without abstracting too far and thereby losing the value proposition? Would would you also be looking at those intersections? you know, those intersection points where there's commonality in the culture, or would you, t you know, tend to look at a completely different model? Uh, same model, but, um, but I'll, I'll tell you what the, what the major shift is, is simply not being bound by um, maybe a corporate or a political desire to have a single global brand. I'm not saying a single global brand is not possible. It certainly is. But at the end of the day, we don't get to choose. The consumer actually chooses what our brand means. And, and if in one market it fundamentally means something totally different than it does in its home market, then you got to deal with that. And, and, yeah. and then the question is, okay, what is the tie that – is there a tie that binds? If so, what is it? How do we leverage it? You, know, you can certainly assess the opportunity to – could we migrate the belief system in one market to be consistent with another so that we actually have some efficiencies? Okay, that's fine. I yeah. think the track yeah. record globally on that is actually pretty hit and miss. Uh, I, I don't think there's like this great model that says, here's exactly how you do it and it'll always work. It feels to me like some brands do it, some brands, most brands actually struggle to actually implement a global brand. Yeah, yeah. So last question. I know we're going a couple minutes over, so I want to thank everyone for sticking with us, but uh, I'm having too much fun in the conversation, and I, I, I do want to get to this last question because I think it talks about something that we touched on a few minutes ago, but I think it certainly is a little bit forward-looking. I think it's a great point to end. Um, when we talk about Bright Shiny, and I think, you know, we marketers tend to get really lost in the luxury of channels where we begin to think about, okay, what are we going to do with social? What are we going to do with mobile? Oh, my gosh, let's, how, does, how does our brand change across all of these messages? And we focus a little too much on the messaging rather than that, uh, you know, rather than on the purpose, I think, sometimes, and we, we get a little lost in that. Um, the thing that is, it seems to be on the cusp right now of kind of what is going to be that potentially next new shiny, certainly augmented reality. Um, one of the questions that's come in here is it says, augmented reality is a promising technology that creates immersive experiences on a mobile
mobile device. How do you see augmented reality or technologies like this playing a role in marketing and commerce for brands, especially when we start talking about, you know, whether it is that, uh, you know, when we talk about kind of what, what society wants to see in our brands, um, you know, augmented reality, it's either going to go really great or it could go really, really wrong. Um, so what are you seeing for new technologies like this? Are you seeing, uh, you know, opportunities? Are you seeing new opportunities, opportunities to engage authentic, you know, in an, an authentic manner? Um, or are you seeing distractions? Uh, well, the only thing that, that is guaranteed is that both extremes will occur. Uh, right. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, it, pro- probably the, the absolute best example is what Lowe's uh, Home Improvement Warehouse is doing with augmented reality um, with their hollow room. I don't know if everybody's mm-hmm. aware of this, but you, 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 can, you basically could, um, you know, do an augmented reality shopping trip where you have images of your own home and, and pull in objects that you could buy in, in the store or order from the store and see what it looks like in your own home by simply putting on a, a pair of glasses. You know, that is a tremendous value add of the experience. You know, I don't know about you, but when I go into, you know, those kind of home improvement warehouses and I need to get, you know, uh, a chair or a, a, some kind of blower for the kitchen, you know, I, I'm just absolutely overwhelmed to be able to Oh, yeah, like don't ask me for paint some, chips, like ever. <laughs> oh, my God, absolutely, right? Or I, I need those little fuzzy things to go underneath the chair. Where do I even find them? Uh, right. But, but, to, but to be able to go in and and be able to see what is unimaginable is a tremendous value add for a retailer. So, yeah. I, I, you know, augmented reality, I mean, why on earth are we going to go shopping for our groceries anymore in a real store? I would rather just stand in front of my fridge, put on, you know, a, a headset, and uh, and go virtual shopping based on what's actually, you know, missing, right? Why yeah, do I have to go yeah. to the store anymore? I, I, I yeah. think it's going to be a wonderful extension of the experience. Even, I even think maybe we'll be going on vacation or at least testing vacation spots by using augmented reality. I think the, the opportunities are just mind-boggling. Yeah, certainly seeing, you know, I've, I've certainly seen a lot of case studies, um, you know, through the Oculus Rift program where they've seen, uh, you know, kind of you can, you can tour everything from Vegas to Miami before you want to go by. So I think it's, uh, it's yeah. opening up a lot of opportunities, but I think that it also opens up a pitfall that you had talked about earlier, right, of, um, you know, what, 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 customers who are very savvy and they are going to get smart fast on things like augmented reality, um, they really want it to be reality. You know, you don't want to walk, you don't want to see the glamorized picture and only that of, you know, only the beaches of Miami. You want to see, you might want to see the nightlife, you might want to see the stores, you might want to see the hotels. You kind of, they're going to want to decide where they want to drive. Um, and I think you said it best is, you know, that we don't get to be the ones that decide what the value of the brand is oftentimes. It's in the control of our customers. So I think uh, a lot of that content yeah. is going to go that way too. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting or, to see how that pans out. Or, or if you happen to be a manufacturer or a marketer of a product that is low engagement, like paper cups, hey, guess what? Right. I think people aren't going to want to have an augmented reality experience on paper cups. That doesn't mean right. that, you should, you know, that you should dash into that, that technology. Exactly. Exactly. No, that's a great point. Well, listen, John, thank you so much for uh, sticking with me. Folks, don't worry. We are going to check on Matt. We're going to make sure that he's okay. Um, but uh, we, we completely understand him, and I appreciate that he was able to stick with us as pos- as long as he could. Um, for those of you, you know, l- Here's the thing. I'm going to make the plug for Bob Evans right here and right now. Go on their website and just check out the savory meatloaf cupcake. Um, I've been staring at it for like the last two hours. And then when he put up the picture of the biscuits, I thought it was incredibly mean because um, I live nowhere near a Bob Evans. But uh, I might have to make a trip uh, out just to have those. But um, really great, really great content from you both. John, I want to thank you so much. Um, a reminder to folks, the link to the book is right in the attachment section. So be sure to go in there. It is a free offer right now. Now and John, I think you're giving away two, right? So uh, one for yourself and one for Indeed. a colleague. So uh, I think that's an awesome place to start. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks to uh, your entire organization with fresh, fresh squeezed ideas. I think uh, some really great stuff coming out of that. Uh, this will be on demand in the next few minutes. But thank you all so much for joining us and uh, sticking with us even a few minutes afterwards. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.